We're going to give just a couple of seconds to let folks trickle in. Thank you to everyone who has already joined us. Good morning, everyone. We're happy to have you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know um, some folks may join us a little bit later, and um, we'll welcome you then. So I'm so excited that you are all here today. Welcome. Um, I'm Kelly, and I'm a member of our community team here at Higher Ground Education and Guidepost Montessori. Um, I also happen to be a former Montessori elementary teacher, um, as well as a Montessori child. I first want to go over a couple of housekeeping items um, before we get into the good stuff. So um, first off, we will be recording this webinar. I just wanted to let you know that. And it will be made available after our series runs. If you have questions as Lisa is talking, um, please write them in our questions tab on the panel. And I will relay them to Lisa during the Q&A portion. Please do ask us questions. We love getting them and we'll leave plenty of time at the end um, for Lisa to respond. And if we could, let's go ahead and test that out. Um, see if you can find it and type in where you are joining us from so we can get a sense of that. And if you're, if you're joining us from one of our Guidepost campuses, we'd love to know that too. So I'm gonna take a peek at the Charlotte, North Carolina. We've got Washington, DC, Toronto. We have in Washington. Some Vienna folks, that's very exciting. Switzerland. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> Paris, California. We have a much more international crowd than we've had in the past. This is very exciting. Oh, this um, is super okay. exciting. Fairfax, Virginia. Fantastic. Virginia. Um, well, I'm very excited to introduce Lisa Kathleen, um, who will be sharing her wisdom with us today. Lisa Kathleen is an AMI trained Montessori elementary guide, um, as well as a parenting coach and a parent educator for, um, uh, sorry, with more than 20 years of experience working with hundreds of families. Um, and she's also a Montessori mom. So within our organization, Yay. she's of the prepared Montessorian training team. And she's just as passionate about Montessori as she is about parenting. So I know I have personally really enjoyed collaborating with her as we were planning for this webinar. Um, and I'm thrilled to learn more from her today. And I'm confident that you'll be glad that you joined us. So I'm gonna turn this over to Lisa, but I'm gonna stay on um, to help facilitate with some polling and questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. I'm super excited to be here. And I usually love to speak and see the people that I'm speaking with. So I'm really missing knowing that you're out there. So um, Kelly is going to share a poll with you in a little while so that we can get your feedback and get your questions. And I really encourage you to participate um, as much as you can throughout uh, by, um, by participating in the chat. So I'm Lisa Kathleen. I am part of the prepared Montessori and teacher training team here at Guidepost. And I'm the parent of a 14 year old. And that's her in the picture when she was about four years old. I'm a trained Montessori guide for six to 12 year olds with years of classroom experience, as Kelly mentioned. And I've also run my own business as a parenting coach and parent educator. And I have worked in classrooms with toddlers and three to six year olds as well. So I read my very first book about Montessori when I was 15. And my first book about parenting that same year because I really figured that I wanted to be a teacher. And so if I wanted to be a teacher, I needed to understand education. And I figured a lot of the skills needed for parents were the same skills that were needed for teachers. So I started reading books about parenting and education at that time. When I originally heard about five years ago about the Guidepost mission and the work that this organization is doing, I actually picked up my family, just my daughter and I, I'm a single mom, and we moved from Canada down here to California so that I could be a part of this team. So I am extremely passionate about Montessori and um, I really, really believe that the Montessori approach is the way to support children and families. And this is particularly true at this very challenging time right now. I know it's a personally challenging time for many of us, and it's certainly a culturally challenging time for all of us. And 
uh, Montessori was made for times like these. So the topic of our webinar today is Montessori at home, and I'm going to give special attention to the topic of working at home with your young children, because I know that many of you are in that situation now, and do be prepared for the poll, because uh, Kelly does have one question that's going to specifically ask you uh, if you are working from home at this time, or if you are simply at home with your children and, and trying to figure out how to uh, how to arrange your, your home for your children in that way. Um, and I would say most importantly for the topic of this webinar, as a single mom, I worked close to full time from home between the time that my daughter was one and the time that she was three. And then when she continued on to her part, uh, part time preschool, which was only three hours a day, I continued to work from home nearly full time until she was about six. So this time frame between the ages of three and six of and, and talking about how we work from home with children and and uh, prepare our homes for our children is really near and dear to my heart so i'd love to show you this is my girl and i'm going to start with a story about what young children are capable of one day when my girl was about three and a half, I had left her with a friend of mine. My friend had picked her up from school along with a couple of other children. They had all come back to my house while I went out and met with a family that I was doing some parenting coaching for. And when I came home, I was late. It was about one o'clock, 1.30. Um, and I realized as I was coming up the steps to my house that I had forgotten to leave lunch for my daughter. So I ran up the steps of my house and I ran in the door and I said, everybody, I'm so sorry. I completely forgot to leave lunch. And my friend looked over at me. She waved her hand in the air and she said, that's okay. She fried herself an egg. And in that moment, I realized how amazing it was that my three-year-old could do this on her own. And I knew, of course, that that was due to my background as a Montessori teacher and the, the work I'd done preparing her to do things at home. In this picture here, she's actually making pancakes, but she uh, just fried me an egg for breakfast this morning, along with pancakes. And um, I, my leftover pancakes are sitting here off to the side because she has been cooking and cleaning and caring for the home. Whoop. Oh, that's funny, I'm missing a slide here. Um, huh, I'm hoping I'm not missing more slides. Okay, so she's been cooking and cleaning and I, I had a picture of, here, of her here at age 14 um, because she is taking care of her schoolwork, training our new puppy, taking care of our house and cooking and caring for uh for all of our homes needs and many of my needs during this time here because we have families in our network with infants all the way through high school so of course as an organization the last few weeks have been very very busy and intense for all of us as we recalibrate to this new situation so um i'm sorry i can't show you the picture of her because she's pretty adorable uh, they're doing her uh, cooking and, and caring for our home. As we move forward throughout this webinar, I'm going to share some principles that you can apply in setting up your own home and preparing your child to work from home and be at home successfully with you. And here's the first one. You'll notice that several activities that we talk about during the time that we're here together are activities of daily life. So here's the first principle. Children love practical life activities. Children age three to six particularly want to be part of the life of the family and they want to do the things that you do. So whenever you can include your children in practical life activities and set your child up to be able to do those activities independently. So let's take a look now at what working at home with young children looks like. In the time that we have together today, we're gonna to talk 
about what it looks like to prepare your home for your young children to thrive in general. And I'm gonna give special attention to the idea of working at home with young children, since I know that many of you are in this boat. So Kelly, if you wouldn't mind sharing our poll questions now, then I can learn a little bit about everybody who's here on the call with us and hear a little bit about why you're here with us today. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna start with which best describes your situation and I'm gonna launch the poll for you to respond to. Great, thank you. I assume you can still hear me? I can hear you, Kelly. Okay, good. It looks like we have 74% of folks voted. I'm gonna give it just a little bit more time. We're up to 77. Okay, great, thank you. So everyone, my goal today is to give you a really strong overview of what it can look like to inspire your child's work at home and to work at home yourself. And if you're not already part of our Family Framework Forum, I'd also love to direct you there. It's super, super comprehensive and it can give you all the activities that you might need to meet your child at their specific developmental level. And it'll give you perspective on pretty much everything that you'll experience working on home with, working from home with your children as well. And our basic family framework program is totally free. So please do, you know, check in there and see what you can, um, see what you might be able to learn from that. Kelly, are we right. ready for the next poll question? Great. I think so. Um, I'll go ahead and share. It looks like most people have responded to this one. And it looks like 39% of our group says that they're at home with children, but not working. Mm -hmm. And 47% are working from home and also have children at home. And 14% uh, have another situation. Okay, great. So I'm going to do my best to, to really balance uh, today between those two primary situations that we have. All right, and let me go to, or do you want to go to the next one or shall we? Yep, wait? go ahead to the next poll question. Okay. Let's go through all of them. All right, um, so this is how old is the child that brought you to this webinar? And I'm going to go ahead and open that up. So you may have multiple children, we realize, um, but since this was focused on three to six, we were assuming that you had children in that um, age bracket, although that may not apply to everyone if you have other reasons for attending. Um, but if you have a child, child in that age bracket, how old are they? So I've got answers rolling in. It looks like 76% of you have voted. Got 84%, give it a little bit longer to try to collect more information. Thank you, Kelly. All right, I think we have the bulk of responses at this point. So it looks like um, a very tiny percentage, 1% are under two. Um, the bulk of children, 72% are between two and four. Mm -hmm. And we've got 17% between five and six. And I think the percentages are shifting as I'm saying this. So if this doesn't add up to 100 in the end, that's why. Okay. Um, we've got a uh, 4% of our group that has a child over six and 5% that this doesn't apply to. Okay, great. So hopefully we have some maybe school leaders or um, others on the call as well. Good. Is there a third question or is that both of them? Um, we've got one more question and that is, does your child that brought you to this webinar typically attend school? Oh, great. I'm going to go ahead and launch that one. And so we've got a couple of options, as you can see, if they attend one of our guidepost schools or perhaps another Montessori school or another kind of school or daycare, or maybe your child doesn't attend school, or maybe this doesn't apply to you. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. This will really give me a bit of a sense for how um, how many people in the group are uh, already quite confident in Montessori philosophy versus maybe not having very much background in Montessori. So it'll help me direct uh, how I share information through the talk. All right, it looks like we have a pretty good response rate, so I'll go ahead and share out the results. 
Um, mm -hmm. The majority of our group actually attends one of our guidepost schools. That's 36%. 19% uh, attend another Montessori school. Super. 27% attend another kind of school or daycare. 13% mm -hmm. um, typically doesn't attend school. And then for 6%, they have a different situation. Super, thank you very much. That's really helpful for me. So it sounds like we have a, a pretty good balance of different um, backgrounds and families as well. So that's super. Thank you all for sharing. So sometimes working from home can be a little bit messy. I don't know if any of you or many of you have seen this adorable video of a dad um, trying to give a BBC interview with his little children in the background. We can see little one stepping into the screen here. And then we see um, dad trying to push little one away and, and baby number two zooming onto the scene as well. Then we see, this is actually my favorite um, moment, we see mom running into the room full speed ahead trying to pull both children out. And now we see mom full on dragging those two little ones off the screen. And then she crawls back in to close the door. And of course, dad's trying really hard not to laugh. And so I'm, this is what it can look like working at home with young children. And so we know that um, we're all having uh, these kinds of challenges right now when we are working at home newly with our children. And what I want to say about that is that regardless of whether you are working at home or simply trying to prepare your home for your children to thrive, the, what we do, the result or the, um, the method of arranging your home and, and preparing your day is the same. So um, I just wanted to start with that and a little bit of humor. And Kelly is going to send the link to that video uh, home to you in the email that she sends at the end of our time together today. Here's one of my personal favorite working from home moments when my girl was just barely four. I was actually on an hour long parenting coaching call and she was doing her own thing. And I saw her walking back and forth past me several times. The first time she walked by, she took a hammer from the toolbox. Then she took a screwdriver. Then, and you can see the hammer there is a child size hammer. Then she took some wood of various sizes, then some nails and some screws. And finally she walked by with a saw. At, uh, when she walked by with the saw, I reminded her to put on some running shoes to protect her feet. So I interrupted my call for a moment to do that. At the end of the hour, just as I was finishing my call, she came to me and she said, mommy, how do you write? Nature turns it all worthwhile. She was just, just about four, four, maybe four and a half at this time. So I wrote it down for, for her on a piece of paper and handed it to her. And when the call was done, she came and she showed me this garden sign that she had made. Now, that could only happen because she had practiced all of those composite skills over time. She had practiced using a hammer, using a screwdriver, using a saw, and writing, of course, before that day. Before that day, she had spent time practicing each of those skills separately. My daughter needed my input just for a minute or two to support her with her project. I also took a couple of minutes during my call to slip out to the balcony and take a picture of her working. So today we're gonna to talk about what it looks like to prepare your home so that they can pursue their own goals, as my daughter did, while you're pursuing yours. What I find amazing about supporting children in this way, again, is that it means that you'll be meeting your developmental needs as well. Here's another example of what it can look like to work from home. This is Rebecca. You can see her there in the background and her two sons uh, working. Uh, this was actually just this past week. Many of us 
uh, have had our children typically in our guidepost schools and are now setting up a work from home environment um, as we uh, manage this immense change with our organization. So ideally, as you can see here, you'll have workspaces for your child near your own workspace. In my case, our balcony was a very common workspace for my daughter. I could see it from where I was working, so I was able to make sure she was safe and comfortable. Uh, here And here, Rebecca uh, has set up two separate tables for her sons in her main work area in the house so that she can work alongside them as well. And here's another principle. Have activity storage and workspaces near where you work in a few areas in your home. So it may be your kitchen. It may be your main work area like this. It may be the place that you go to have a phone call so that you're within uh, eye range of your younger children. So young children love to be close to their parents and they will need your support. So rather than having your children work or play away from you in a playroom or a bedroom, this makes it easier for a child to find something meaningful to do near you and for you to respond to them if they need you. We recommend this all the time whether you're working from home or not because again young children love to be close to parents so even if you're not working from home you will be doing whatever activities you're doing at home whether it's you know working in the kitchen or cleaning uh, you know the doing the laundry so whatever else that you're doing reading your own books um while you're at home making phone calls etc you can always have these activity spaces and workspaces um, near the areas that you are going to spend the most time in in your home so that your child can find their separate activity whenever they wish to do so. And here's another part of that. And you saw in Rebecca's situation here, the boys each have their own workspace. We definitely recommend that you support siblings to have their own work. I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but I really wanna mention it briefly because one of the fundamental ways that we can support siblings to get along well together before they're developmentally ready to really work with others and share an activity is to support them to have their own separate workspaces and their own separate work. So um, the time, between the ages of two and four particularly, children really need to have their own work and their own workspaces. By the time they're five, they are beginning to have the ability to work with others uh, in, a, in a more um, intensive way. So let's talk a little bit about what Montessori called sensitive periods. And we're gonna focus and kind of hone in on the three to six year old here. The young child has driving developmental needs, and those needs are the same whether they're at school or they're at home. You know that when a child's learning to walk, that child pretty much does nothing else besides practicing walking all day long. I remember my daughter actually doing squats in the middle of our kitchen floor at the time that she was learning to walk. This intense focus happens because children have a very limited time during which it's easiest for them to learn to walk. And that time frame is also paired with the child's deep desire to practice whatever the new skill is, so in this case, walking. That's called the sensitive period. It's the time when, the, it, it's, the time when it's easiest for the child to learn the skill, paired with the time when the child has the, the biggest developmental drive to learn this skill. And we hear people talk about this concept all the time with language. It's the reason why children who learn a second language when they're under the age of six speak nearly perfectly with no accent, but older children, teens or adults who learn that second language almost always speak imperfectly and carry an accent, usually for their entire lives. So the three to six year olds has three overarching sensitive periods. There's one for order, one for movement, and one for language. We're gonna go 
uh, more deeply into the sensitive periods for order and movement today. And I'll touch briefly on some, uh, uh, the, some activities that might go um, with some, with a variety of different other interests that children of this age have. But the sensitive periods tell us what the child of this age needs. And the needs are the same, whether the child's at school at home or at home. But how we meet those needs will be different depending on the environment that we have and the materials that we have available in the environment. And our family framework program has a number of different activities that are based on things that everybody has at home. So again, I definitely recommend that you check in there, especially as we're talking about general principles here today, some of the specific activities that will meet your child's particular needs and interests, you'll be able to find through the family framework. So the first sensitive period of the young child is a sensitive period for order. This is especially important now because the normal day-to-day -day of the child is so different now than it was a month ago in many, I'd say most cases for most children. As adults, we can see ahead, we can see that this is temporary, but children don't have that same perspective. So we would need to work especially hard right now to meet the child's need for order. So there's three key ways that we meet the child's need for the young child. And the routines that we put in place for daily life are the first. The second are the expectations that we have for the child and keeping those expectations really clear. And the third is the orderly physical environment that we provide. So here are some examples of a day-to-day -day routine that you might uh, plan on and practice. Having a consistent schedule and then associating each part of that schedule with clear and consistent routines really nurtures the young child's spirit. At this age, the child has so little control over her own day. So when she knows what's going to happen next, it gives her a sense of control, a feeling of safety, and a sense of trust in the world and in you. So instead of having to spend her energy adjusting to new situations, when the routine is strong, she can instead focus her energy on learning new things. So step one, when you're working at home with your child is to clarify your plan, figure out what schedule you're going to do your best to stick to, and then plan the associated routines. You might have a routine around getting dressed, brushing teeth, having breakfast, your work period, having snack, etc. And here are a few ways that you can support your child as you're establishing those new routines. The first is by using many verbal cues and reviewing those verbal cues throughout the day. So it might sound like, today is Thursday. It's a working day for me and for you. That means that this is what we're going to do today. And then you go through the basics of your daily routine. You might say, okay, it's just about lunchtime. First we'll have lunch, then we'll go outside, then we'll come back in, and each of us will wash our hands, and then I'll do my work and you'll do work, your work. Or you might say, as soon as I'm finished, we're going to, and explain what's going to happen next. So when you signpost like this and give your child lots of verbal cues throughout the day, you help them to identify the order that's happening around them. And that temporal order is particularly um, soothing to the young child. The second way that you can support your young child with developing new routines is through visual cues. Now I've pulled some pictures out here to show getting dressed, eating breakfast, brushing teeth, but you may instead just draw little pictures, a little pair of pants, um, a, a bowl of cereal and a toothbrush, for example, which are very, very simple to do, to just remind your child what the routine looks like. This is especially helpful if you have a child who's having trouble adjusting to a new routine or if you're having trouble moving the routine forward, which can sometimes happen when there's lots going on, which there is for everybody right now. 
The other way that can be very helpful is to have a calendar. And I like this kind of calendar that's shown here in this picture. It has nice big squares in it so that you can, again, draw little pictures of things that happened on certain days or are going to happen. You can use color, you can use um, language, or you can use pictures uh, on the calendar for a young child. And certainly up through age six, your older children particularly will love doing things like drawing pictures of what happened each day at the end of the day, or some of the things that you're planning for future days in the calendar. And this will, again, give them a really, um, a, a way to anchor their day and to see the external order that's happening in the world and particularly as it pertains to time. So the second thing that we recommend is having very clear expectations for what the day is going to look like for your child. If part of your goal is to set up your family's day so that parents can get some work done as well, then one of the key aspects of setting expectations will be around interruptions. I'm just going to um, touch on this one here today. So you, you're going to start um, setting up your day by clarifying the routine and then you're going to take some time to address particular situations that may come up, for example, interruptions. So what should your child do if they have a question and you're not available? We recommend role playing the scenario with your child several times ahead of time. So, for example, you might have a system where your child sits in a waiting chair or puts her hand on your shoulder or um, passes you a favorite toy and you um, let them know that you will come as soon as you can. So the child has different things that they can do while they're waiting for you so that they're not interrupting what you're doing and that they develop the ability to wait. Now, of course, for younger children, it's a little bit harder, but by the time a child is three and a half or four, most children can develop this ability to uh, wait a little bit longer, find something else to do while you're while you're busy, and then to um, you know ask their question uh, in a few minutes when you are ready to respond to them. Now, if you're doing this and and just practicing this as your child's developing this skill uh, for the first time, we definitely recommend that the first few times that your child comes to you with whatever technique it is to get your attention, that you respond as quickly as you possibly can so that they know that that system is going to work. And once you get the system down and then they've developed a bit of trust in that system, you'll be able to expect them to wait a little bit longer, of course, depending on their age and their personality. And so the principle here is to role play new ways of doing things. Whenever you can, if you've got a new, um, a new uh, technique that you're going to use or a new routine, role play ahead of time as best you can. This is also particularly helpful when you're working with siblings to um, help them find ways to get along better together, help them know how to interrupt each other, how to um, ask each other if it's okay to share in the work or to, um, to uh, for example, sit and watch the other child while they work. And here's the third key. This is the third aspect of the child's need for order, the orderly environment. In the classroom, it looks like this. We don't keep our classrooms like this because we think children should be orderly. We keep our classrooms like this because an orderly, beautiful, physical environment nurtures their spirits. It meets their need for predictability and it makes them feel safe. We know that order makes young children feel happy. And so we create an orderly classroom environment. Now you see here, this particular shelf in the classroom, that each activity is on the shelf in its own particular area. And so here's a principle. In your own home, Keep each complete activity in a separate and, de and designated space. Here's another classroom example. 
for those of you whose young children do attend our schools, you've seen also how carefully the children put their work away when they're finished. Because the child always sees that material in that place and because we show the child how to take the work out and how to put it away, the child knows where each thing belongs and how to put it away properly. And they happily take part in the work of keeping the classroom organized. And so here's another principle. Show the child how to take the work out and how to put it away. This really nurtures their sense of order. It also teaches a multi-step process that develops the child's executive functioning skills. So when they begin an activity, they begin the activity at the time they take it out and they finish it at the time that it's put away. So all of the steps involved gives them the opportunity to really plan ahead and think through each of those different steps. And we'll talk a little bit more about executive functioning skills later. As an added bonus, a longer process gives you more time to focus on the things that you may need to do if you're working from home with your child. Here's a third shelf. When young children are presented with this orderly environment, they will reflect that order in their behavior. So we recommend that you reduce the amount of stuff in your home as much as you can and really clarify what the options are for the child to work with in this way. We know that external order leads to internal order. For the young child, all that is in the world is so new and the drive to identify the order in the environment is the drive to understand the world. So young children love working with order. Might look like this or like this. The child works with the materials to detect the order within them. So let's talk again about those three sensitive periods, the young child's work. Here they are again, those sensitive periods. We're gonna look at them in a little bit more depth, particularly the sensitive period for order and for movement. But first I wanna talk a little bit about the concept of work in general. If you've been around Montessori at all, which many of you have, you know that we love to talk about the child's work and here's why. We know that children have an intense inner desire to learn and to discover and to engage in the world. When the child engages deeply at just the right level, they are happy. Montessori observed this, but we also see it in adults. Researchers have studied what they call flow. And the flow state is a state when a person is performing an activity and is fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement and enjoyment. So we now know that it's not only children who concentrate and become happy. Because of all this research on flow, we also know that it's the same for adults as well. The more time that an adult spends in the flow state, the happier they are. And incidentally, they also tend to be some of the most successful adults as well, both personally and professionally. So our goal with providing work for the child that is meaningful to them is really this, this ultimate goal of happiness. And here's the principle. Look for work that fascinates the child. Seek concentration and seek flow. It might look like this. Look at the faces of these two children. They're clearly concentrating and interested in the work that they're doing. The child may be doing dishes or they may be doing math. If the child's concentrating on developing a new skill and working at the edge of their ability, that child will drop into flow state, be absorbed in the work for an extended period of time and emerge feeling happy. So here's why flow state matters. 
when our children develop the ability to concentrate at this young age, it carries forward. So their ability to concentrate grows as they take on bigger, more challenging work, as they move beyond the sensitive periods for movement and order and early language to master more academic skills, such as language and math, um, and to develop the ability to turn the imagination in the elementary years towards great feats of creativity, innovation, science. So children practice these activities now. It may be dishwashing with many steps, which encourages the development of the executive functioning skills I mentioned earlier. Those are skills such as the ability to plan, the ability to delay gratification, the ability to identify cause and effect, the ability to persist in the face of adversity. This is also called grit and working memory and the ability to correct course. So all of these executive functioning skills are intimately connected with both success and happiness as an adult. So when we offer the child work that meets them at their level and inspires them to concentrate deeply, we are setting them up not just for today, but for a lifetime of establishing and setting his or her own goals and then working to achieve them. So let's take a quick look at this same picture through a different lens and look at the particular activity that the children are involved in. So this is an activity that involves several steps that the child has to keep in order. If you've remembered to teach the child how to take the work out and also teach them how to put this work away, then you, then you can think about all of the steps that are involved in this. They have to fill the tub, later they have to empty the tub, they have to get the soap, etc. So the child has to remember all of those steps and has to do the steps in order to be successful with the activity. Again, we're focusing on the sense of order for the child. Let's see here. So here are the sensitive periods again. We've talked quite a lot about the sensitive period for order and we can apply that to the child's work as well. Children of this age love sorting things, sorting Lego by color or size or shape. They love sorting a collection of shells and stones and sticks into their categories, for example. They love sorting clean laundry, organizing each type of clothing and then sorting again by who it belongs to, for example. In all cases, first show the child how to do the activity, then leave them to it. Here are some of the other kinds of work that we might offer the child. So these are not particularly associated with these broader sensitive periods, but the child also loves practical life, as I mentioned before. They're at a particular time where they are relating sensorially to the world and un understanding the world through their senses. And of course, there's math work that can be offered to them. Um, Many of these kinds of work and particular activities are again listed in our uh, family framework. And if you are looking to work and have us help you tailor to your particular child, we also have a parent concierge option that you can, um, that you can uh, subscribe to that will support you with personal kind of personal coaching around each of these areas. So let's talk a little bit more about movement work and what that would look like at home. For the next several slides, I'm gonna show some specific activities and then share details of how those activities fit into the child's sensitive periods and then some of the principles that we use to create deep engagement. So here again, the child is moving and here's an activity that supports the child's sensitive period for movement. They're digging in mud. The mud is heavy. So the child has to practice controlling the shovel with his arm. He's balancing on the edge of the puddle. He's controlling his whole body in a really particular way. And he's got to dig, pushing into the mud under the water and using his whole body 
to do this work. Here's another example of the child of this age and how much they love movement. This is the classic Montessori movement activity of walking on the line. It's an activity that's very easy to do at home with some masking tape or sidewalk chalk if you're outdoors. And this activity meets the child's need for precise movement. I wanna to touch on a specific aspect of the Montessori activities. The child is not just told to go walk on the line. The child is shown precisely how to walk on the line. Children under six are still perfecting language, so they can't process language and visual input at the same time. So when we show them how to do something, we just show them. We don't speak at the same time. This way the child can focus on the precise movements and will make effort to imitate those movements exactly and will be much more successful in imitating the movements because they were able to focus on them as they were, as they were um, observing. So it might sound like this. I'm going to walk on the line. Watch. So we ask the child to watch and then we work in silence, showing them exactly what to do. So we carefully place the foot centered exactly over the line and we roll from heel to toe. Then we pause, make eye contact with the child and whisper, watch again. We take another step, carefully placing the foot in front of the other and rolling from heel to toe. In this way, you give the child something specific and interesting to focus on a very precise way to walk on the line. And once the child has mastered this, you may show the child how to walk on the line while carrying a small bean bag on their head or carrying a glass of water in their hands. On another day, you may show how to walk on the line with big, long steps, for example. So these two principles, here's one, Oh, here's my girl actually. I'll show this one first. The first principle is the principle of separating words and movement. And just here's another example of the kind of precision. This is my daughter again, and she's making cookies here. And I showed her exactly how to scoop the cookie dough onto the tray. I showed her how to get just the right amount of cookie dough and how to tuck the spoon in at the top of the other spoon and then how to slide that spoon down and you can see in her face the degree of concentration that she's needing to do this activity very precisely. So that's our principle there, to separate words and movement. Watch, we say to the child. And the second principle is to show every step precisely. So here's my girl again. Remember this picture? When she was two, I showed her how to use the hammer. First, I started the nails for her in a great big stump, and I used those nails, the ones with great big heads on them, so they were easier for her to hit. Then I started nails for her with little heads on them. I started nails that were thicker, so she had to hit them harder to get them into the stump. And finally, I carefully showed her how to hold the nails and then start them herself. She did this by the time she was maybe three. When she was three, I showed her how to use a screwdriver. I started the screws for her in that same big stump and I showed her the wrist movement and how to turn a bit, then move her hand back to where she started and turn her turn a bit Again, so again, we're breaking down the movement and showing each and every step. A few months before she made this, I had shown her how to use a saw. For this, I showed her how to insert the saw between the boards on our balcony. You can see the boards there. And I showed her how to put one foot with a running shoe on, on one side of the board to hold it in place and to saw first by pulling just a few times 
Then she could saw carefully in a back and forth motion. So by the time she was four, she figured out how to do all of those movements in a new situation and to put them all together into her creative work here. To do this all independently while I was on the phone, the other thing she had to know was where to find the hammer and nails, where to find the screwdriver and screws, the saw and all those various pieces of wood. So we'll revisit this principle. Keep each activity in a designated space. So the young child's work. I'm gonna to just touch very briefly on the sensitive period for language and just um, really encourage you to speak clearly, to use interesting language with your young children and to use the real names of things. Children love to know the parts of a leaf, for example, and they love to learn new vocabulary. At this age, they're particularly interested in naming things. So not so much how things work, but what they are. So you can really encourage them and inspire them with interesting language. And again, our family framework really goes through some um, amazing activities that can meet your child's need for language, especially those older children. I know a few of you do have five and six year olds. Um, so once the child is more advanced with language and needs some more um, uh, some more challenging activities, the family framework can walk you through how to do that. Um, the other kinds of work that young children are particularly interested in are practical life, the sensorial work, and the math work. And again, we're not going to touch on these here, but I wanted to, to bring those in and just inspire you to pursue some of those activities as well. Okay, we have just about 10 more minutes and I'd love to open it up to questions. Kelly, do you have any questions that are coming up uh, in the side panel there in the chat that have come up through the, the presentation? I do. Um, let's see, let's start with a question from Brian. He says, my son performed performs independently well at school. Um, however, at home with me, he is only okay if I'm not on my laptop or phone working. If I am doing other work, mm -hmm. he's okay. Is there a way to keep him feeling connected to me when I have to work on the laptop? Yes, definitely. So one of the things that I would recommend is to have a few specific activities that he really likes doing that are not screen related for him that are particularly um, activities for when you're on the laptop. So if you can come up with some favorite games or favorite activities that are particularly um, fun for him and set those up and then have them away and only bring them out when it's time for you to be working, that will help him get used to the idea. Um, but this is something that's going to take a little while. Um, the other thing that I would highly recommend is setting him up near you at a table and then talking to him about it's time for me to do my work and it's time for you to do your work at the same time. You're doing your work here and I'm doing my work here. Make sure that before you go on the laptop, you've already got him set up doing something that's interesting to him. And so the way to do that would be to take him by the hand, walk around in your environment, show him some of the activities that he could do, help him choose something, help him take it out, and let him know before you do this that he's going to do this work while you do your work. And then, um, you know, you're going to set it up as a routine. And repetition is really key here. Our children, uh, on the whole, are not used to working independently of you at home. So it's gonna be super important to, to just really reinforce that routine over a period of several days. Great, Hopefully I've got another that's question. helpful. Yes, I've got a question Go ahead, from, from Harley. I'm asking, is concentrating on toy-like matchbox, match, sorry, matchbox cars or action figures the equivalent of more work-related activities? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm gonna say usually, and here's the thing. 
if the child is creating a small world, an imitation of real world activities, this is absolutely um, a, a very positive activity for them. And in most cases, that is what the child's doing. If the child is, um, you know, throwing things and slamming things around, which is probably not what's happening, it's not what you're describing, then, um, then you know, that, that is not encouraged. But um, setting up a small world is the child's way of explaining and understanding the world around them. So as long as it's not going into um, a fantasy world and, you know, really kind of replaying uh, movies over and over again, for example, um, you know, the stories of, you know, beloved movies are one thing, but uh, getting engaged deeply in a back and forth with um, specific characters can be very positive where they, they have getting, they've been getting to know a, perf a specific character through movies uh, or other TV shows and then engaging with them and, and replaying that particular character can also be a very positive activity for the child. Hopefully that's helpful. I think so. Um, I've got another question that asks, my child is four years, three months, and she is great at pretend play. She loves, loves to immerse herself in that where it's hard to engage her in more real life. She loves her dollhouse, mm -hmm. kitchen, and fire station, all of which are in the primary living space. Is that the same as life skills? So this is really a very similar question. And I, I really want to say, um, that yes, I mean, she is practicing engaging when she's having the, the two in the um, in the dollhouse talking together. She's preparing the physical environment um, as she's building that dollhouse, for example. So those activities are also very, very beneficial for the young child. And chances are, especially in a time like this, she's using that play to help her process what's happening in the world around us right now. And so I, I would imagine that if you listen to the play that she's engaging in, um, that's part of it. The other thing that you can really do to help her engage with real life activities is to show her how much you enjoy them yourself. And one of the things I realized was that my daughter didn't like doing dishes when she was really young. And uh, I realized that was probably because every time I did dishes, I was pretty miserable and grumpy about it. And so um, I shifted that energy and her willingness and interest in the activity also changed. So if you're treating daily life activities as a chore, then she's going to treat them as something she's not that interested in doing too. That makes Hopefully sense. That's helpful. Um, I've got a question from Ray, and this might be our last question, um, just because I want to be sensitive to keeping the time. It says, my son has great Montessori training yep. um, and loves times and routines, but it's difficult to calm him during a tantrum. I don't know how or what to do to help him through it. This also um, reminds me that we have another great webinar coming up at the end of the month uh, with Lisa that will go very in-depth into this topic, but maybe Lisa can give us a little preview. Yes, definitely. So the preview is, remember that you are not there to stop your child's emotions. You're there to create a safe container for your child to have those emotions. So when your child is upset, when your child is having the tantrum, it doesn't mean that you should necessarily change your behavior or change your expectations of your child. You just need to give them some time to work through the emotions. So it might sound like, you really didn't like that I put that away right now. It's time to finish our work and it's time to um, get ready for bed. And I know it's hard sometimes to get ready for bed and this is the time for that. You can be as upset as you need to be, and I'll be right here. If you need a hug, let me know. So rather than trying to stop the emotions, allow the child to be upset if they need to and complete that cycle. At some point, usually the 
child will shift from angry to tears. And when the child shifts to tears, you know that they're typically now ready to reconnect with you and um, ready to move on. They say that tears are adaptive. It means that the child's um, adjusting to the new situation and is uh, beginning to be able to accept it. Hopefully that's helpful too, just a uh, really quick overview. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, I really appreciated all of your great suggestions and guidance and insight, um, and I'm excited to welcome you back at the end of the month. I just wanted to mention um, that we are sending out an email. It's actually already gone out and should be in your inboxes that has the family framework resources that Lisa referenced throughout her talk. Um, and also has information about our elementary distance learning program. Um, if you have any elementary students or if you know of any that might be looking for a Montessori program, um, we have a full day program that offers small group lessons and individualized instruction um, with a peer community and opportunities to collaborate uh, with plenty of time offline, even though it's called distance learning. So if you're interested, please do um, go to our website at guidepostmontessori.com forward slash EDL uh, for elementary distance learning. I feel a little like I'm in an infomercial when I'm saying this, but I just wanted to mention it um, in case it <laughs> is relevant to you. Um, I just wanted to thank Lisa for her time. I know we didn't get to all the questions, um, but if you would like to, um, please do follow up. You can send an email to community at twohigherground.com. It's also in the follow-up email. You can just reply to it um, and I will forward them to Lisa um, and she can get back to you personally. So thank you everybody um, and thank you, Lisa. Yes, it was lovely to meet all of you. And, and the other thing that you could do with those questions is bring them into our Family Framework Forum and um, share them with the with the forum because people are really having great conversations about a lot of this type of question as well. It was great yeah. to spend the time with you today. Everybody have a wonderful day. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye, Lisa. Bye, everyone.